so today we will be discussing the ninth chapter earlier in the bhagavad gita knowledge concerning the difference between the soul and the body was described as confidential knowledge in this ninth chapter krishna is going to explain what is the most confidential knowledge what is this most confidential knowledge it is pure devotional service in the previous chapter lord krishna had said that he is attained only by pure devotional service therefore in this chapter krishna will describe pure devotional service in detail arjuna is not envious of krishna which is why arjuna is qualified to hear about this most confidential knowledge krishna describes this knowledge as the king of education and the most secret of all secrets it is the purest knowledge because it gives direct perception of the self by realization it is the perfection of religion it is everlasting and it is joyfully performed further on krishna says those who are not faithful on the path of devotional service they cannot attain krishna therefore such people who are faithless they return to the path of birth and death in this world now krishna describes something about his unmanifested form krishna says he is spread throughout the universe in his unmanifested form he says all beings are in him but he is not in them in his unmanifested form he is not present in anybody what is this unmanifested form of krishna it is the energy of krishna energy of krishna we know is spread everywhere everything in this world is resting on krishna's own energy therefore krishna says all beings are in him are in him means in his energy they are resting on his energy now when he says he is not in them that means he is completely aloof from this world from his energy krishna is completely aloof although krishna is spread everywhere by his energy he does not lose his personality he does not lose his personality krishna further says he has got a specific type of mystic opulence even though all beings are in him he also says by his opulence all beings are not in him also how is that he explains although he is the maintainer of all living beings and although he is spread everywhere he is not a part of this material creation because his self is the source of this creation since he is the source he is aloof from the creation 
to help us understand this mystic opulence of krishna krishna gives an example he says just as the mighty wind blowing everywhere rests always in the sky he says similarly all created beings rest in krishna we know that the wind is blowing everywhere but it does not go beyond the sky the wind is always contained in the sky similarly krishna creates maintains and destroys all living beings still he himself is aloof from everything created as the sky is aloof from the wind wind is contained within the sky but the wind will never mix with the sky or the sky will never mix with the wind similarly krishna creates everything and everything is resting in krishna but krishna is aloof completely aloof from the creation regarding krishna's supreme position he says at the end of every millennium everything that is created enters into his nature and at the beginning of another millennium by his potency krishna creates everything again so he says the whole creation is under him under his will this creation is automatically created again and again and simply by his will it is destroyed at the end of the millennium all this kind of activities do not bind krishna he is always detached from all these material activities as if he is completely neutral now regarding this material nature krishna says it is one of his energies this material nature is one of his energies it is working completely according to his direction under its own rule this material world is created and destroyed again and again and again and again even though krishna is completely aloof from this material world still he remains the supreme director of this entire material creation this is krishna's opulence actually next krishna compares those who do not surrender to him with those who surrender to him he says foolish people they deride krishna when he comes in his human form to this world they do not know krishna's transcendental nature and his supreme control over everything so such people who deride krishna they think he is another ordinary person they are completely bewildered actually and they are attracted by demoniac and atheistic views in such a condition their hopes for liberation their pious activities and their culture of knowledge are all defeated then krishna describes those who are not deluded those who are not bewildered he describes them as great souls those who are not bewildered or deluded he describes they are great souls and they are always under the protection of krishna's divine nature spiritual nature they are fully engaged in devotional service because they know krishna is the supreme lord and he is the original 
personality who is inexhaustible now how is it that these uh, great souls are under the protection of the spiritual nature how is it possible so shrila prabhupada explains these great souls they surrender to krishna as soon as they surrender to krishna they are freed from the control of material nature and consequently they come under the guidance of krishna's spiritual nature now what are the activities of these great souls under the guidance of the devotional or spiritual nature what do they do krishna describes their activities as they are always chanting krishna's glories they endeavor with great determination to serve krishna they bow down to krishna always and these great souls always worship krishna with devotion four specific activities about these great souls are being described by krishna here now moment we say glorification one can only glorify a person it is not possible to glorify something impersonal so shila prabhupada says the impersonalists or those who worship the formless brahman they do not come in the category of great souls so krishna describes about these impersonalists by stating that there are others who are engaging in sacrifice by cultivating knowledge such people they are of three kinds all those who cultivate knowledge by performing sacrifice the first category of such people are described those who worship the supreme as one without a second then there are people second category of people who worship the supreme as diverse in many and the third category of people worship the supreme as the universal form now those who worship the supreme as one without a second they are the category of people who consider themselves as god they think they are god or they think they are one with god those who worship the supreme as diverse in many the second category they consider the various devatas to be different forms of god and the third category people who worship the universal form they consider <coughs> this universe to be god it's very interesting all these three categories of people really do not know who is god so the first category think i am god second category think so many devatas they are all different gods or forms of god and the third category think whole universe is god now krishna says all these people actually are indirectly worshiping him not directly worshiping him some sense of god consciousness is there but they don't exactly know who is god then krishna goes on to describe now remember krishna is revealing the most confidential knowledge which is knowledge about himself hmm? he says krishna says 
that he is the only object of worship for everyone in the entire creation how is that how can we understand this krishna says actually in all sacrifices krishna is the ritual he is the offering he is the healing herb he is the transcendental chant he is the butter he is the fire every aspect of the sacrifice is krishna but people do not know this then further krishna says all studies of the vedas are meant for knowing krishna only all vedic mantras they begin with om and what is this om om is a spiritual sound and om is krishna also krishna is the goal the master the witness the refuge the dear most friend the creation the destruction the basis of everything and the resting place therefore krishna is the eternal cause of all causes by understanding this krishna gives a confidential instruction here best is to directly approach krishna and worship him in his original form for that will save lot of time and energy now krishna only is the one who controls heat who controls rain who controls drought krishna is immortality and death krishna is both matter and spirit therefore in the advanced stage of krishna consciousness a devotee does not make any distinctions between different manifestations in this world the advanced devotee sees krishna in everything now krishna describes one category of people who study the vedas and try to elevate themselves to the heavenly planets why do they do so because they have a desire to enjoy heavenly happiness so such people krishna says they worship him indirectly by performing uh the necessary form of worship they become purified of sinful reactions then they take birth on the pious heavenly planets and they enjoy certain godly delights but what happens when they have exhausted their vast heavenly sense pleasures after the results of their pious activities are exhausted they return to this earth planet again that means they cannot permanently stay after going to heavenly planets they cannot permanently stay there therefore krishna says those who seek a higher grade of enjoyment in the heavenly planets by following the principles of the three vedas they achieve only repeated birth and death but in contrast to those people who study the three vedas and try to get some heavenly pleasures krishna says those devotees who worship krishna with exclusive devotion meditating on his transcendental form such devotees to them krishna says he carries what they lack and preserves what they have that means such devotees are progressive they keep on making progress till ultimately they reach krishna's personal abode krishna also says those who are devotees of other gods other gods means other devatas and who worship these devatas with faith 
actually are worshipping Krishna only, but they are doing so in a wrong way. Why? Why does Krishna say that? Because it is Krishna only who is the enjoyer and master of all sacrifices. This was explained by Krishna in the fifth chapter also. He is the enjoyer of all sacrifices. And one who knows this about Krishna is able to actually attain peace from the pangs of all material miseries. So here he is telling, repeating that, but in a different context he is telling, since he is the only enjoyer and master of all sacrifices, those who do not recognize his true transcendental nature, they fall down, they are unable to uh, elevate themselves beyond birth and death in this material world. Now, different kinds of worship have different destinations. Krishna says, those who worship the demigods will take birth among the demigods. Those who worship the ancestors they go to the ancestors. Those who worship ghosts and spirits will take birth among such beings. And finally, he says, those who worship Krishna will be promoted to Krishna's personal abode and will live with Krishna. Therefore, Krishna specifically describes worship of his transcendental form. He says, if one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, a fruit or little water, I will accept it. This is totally in contrast to so many rules and regulations which are very complex when it comes to worshipping devatas, when it comes to performing sacrifices, when it comes to studying the three Vedas, and engaging in specific worship for elevation to heavenly planets. All those are very, very complicated. Only worship of Krishna is very, very simple. Krishna does not demand many things. He is just asking as a token of your love for me, you may offer me just one leaf or just one flower or just one fruit or a little water. So Srila Prabhupada says, even the poorest man in any part of the world can worship Krishna. But that is not possible as regards worship of some other personality. Only worship of Krishna is this simple. Because in worshipping Krishna, what is important is the devotion of the worshipper. It is the devotion which is important, not the article which is being offered. Hmm. Further, Krishna says about worshipping him, Whatever you do, he is telling, instructing Arjuna and through Arjuna all of us, whatever you do, whatever activity or work you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away in terms of giving charity, whatever austerities you perform, do all of that as an offering to me. Because ultimately we should understand we have a specific relationship with Krishna. Earlier as I had mentioned once, complete self-realization means knowing who I am, who is Krishna and what is my relationship with Krishna. So I am spirit soul, Krishna is a supreme spirit. And I have a relationship with Krishna. 
I means here every one of us, each one of us. So in this world we have forgotten ourself, we have forgotten Krishna and obviously we have forgotten our relationship with Krishna also. So the real aim of spiritual life or spiritual practice or self-realization is to discover our self as spirit, soul, to discover Krishna as the supreme spirit soul and to revive our relationship with Krishna. So that revival of relationship happens when we do everything in connection with Krishna just for the sake of helping us to revive our relationship Krishna is telling do everything as an offering to me it is not that Krishna is in need of anything from us no he is full in himself he is complete in himself he is the unlimited Lord he is the one who supplies everything to everyone else he is the only maintainer of everyone. So certainly he is not in need. So when he says, you make an offering to me, it is for our benefit, so that we can revive our relationship with him. This has to be understood. Further, Krishna says, in this way, by doing everything as an offering to Krishna, and doing such offering with devotion. In this way, you will be freed from bondage to work and its auspicious and inauspicious results. As was explained in the chapter on Karma Yoga, in this world, every action, generally which people do, any activity, it has got some reaction. And that reaction binds us to this world. So it is explained in that third chapter that work should be done as sacrifice to Vishnu if we want to become free from bondage. So that same uh, knowledge Krishna is giving as a confidential knowledge instead of getting into complicated way of doing different types of sacrifices. You can simply do a simple offering to Krishna directly offered to Krishna just one leaf or flower and simply by doing this you become free from all bondage you have no more reactions from any work in this principle of renunciation if you fix your mind upon me you will be liberated and you will come to me. See what Krishna is promising in this particular uh, description of the most confidential knowledge. Mm. Uh, simply by uh, making an offering in devotion to Krishna, one is able to become attracted to Krishna. How can the mind be fixed on Krishna? When one gets attracted to Krishna, you should always remember, Krishna is supremely attractive. The name Krishna itself, what does the name Krishna mean? Of course, there are many meanings to this name. It's a very significant word, Krishna. One of the important meanings of the word Krishna is one who is all attractive supremely attractive so because Krishna is supremely attractive it is very easy to fix our mind on Krishna and by simply fixing our mind on Krishna and engaging in his service by making a devotional offering to him we can become liberated from all material bondage and in the end we are able to 
go to Krishna's personal planet to live with him. Now Krishna further clarifies his special interest he takes in his devotees. He says, I envy nobody, neither I am partial to anyone. I am equal to all. As the Supreme Lord, Krishna is impartial. He is equal to everybody. But he says, one very confidential thing he says here, whoever renders service to Krishna in devotion, such a person is a friend, is in Krishna and Krishna is also a friend to him. So even though Krishna is equal to everybody, he is not partial to anyone, Krishna is neutral. As regards those who are non-devotees, as far as devotees are concerned, Krishna has got a special interest in devotees that he regards Krishna's, uh, he regards such devotees as his friend and he also reciprocates in a friendly way with devotees. Regarding such devotees who are always engaged in his devotional service, Krishna says, even if such a devotee commits the most abominable action, Krishna says, if such a devotee is constantly engaged in devotional service, such a devotee, even if he does the most abominable action, is to be considered saintly. Why? Because simply by engaging constantly in devotional service, such a devotee is properly situated in this determination. What happens? Because of constantly engaging in devotional service, even if sometimes a devotee may commit some mistake, he quickly becomes righteous and he attains lasting peace. Krishna tells Arjuna, declare boldly that my devotee never perishes. Krishna gives special protection to his devotees. Then further, Krishna reveals something very, very confidential again. He says, those who have taken birth in very sinful families or those who are low-born, just like merchants, labor class people or even women, anybody, those of even lower birth, those even born in a sinful background, doesn't matter. If they take shelter of Krishna, they can also attain the highest perfection of going to Krishna's personal abode, never to take birth again in this world. Generally, in the scriptures it is said, one has to gradually elevate oneself. One has to gradually elevate oneself. But if somebody is fortunate to take up devotional service to Krishna under the guidance of an expert devotee spiritual master, then there is no question of gradually elevating oneself. One directly elevates oneself to the highest perfection without going through gradual progress, step-by-step -step progress. No. Not required. So Krishna encourages Arjuna to engage in pure devotional service by saying, how much greater are the righteous brahmanas the devotees, the saintly kings. Therefore, having come to this temporary miserable world, Krishna tells Arjuna, engage in my loving service. And how to do that? Particularly, he says, 
always think of me become my devotee offer your obeisances to me and worship me four things he says specifically being completely absorbed in me surely you will come to me now throughout the bhagavad gita one common theme is there that our ultimate goal should be to uh, go to krishna's personal abode actually this is the secret that is revealed in bhagavad gita also that we don't belong to this world we belong to krishna krishna's personal abode so therefore even though one may adopt some other process of yoga other than bhakti yoga or somebody may follow some other path of practice of spiritual life it doesn't matter the highest perfection is to elevate oneself to krishna's personal abode this is the secret that krishna is revealing in the bhagavad gita particularly in this chapter in the eighth chapter he had spoken about his abode is attainable only by pure devotional service so therefore in this chapter krishna is particularly described pure devotional service now pure devotional service is very rare but by coming in contact with a pure devotee under the expert guidance of a pure devotee anyone can begin pure devotional service and perfect themselves in one lifetime this is the uh, special thing about pure devotional service hmm? so therefore krishna concludes this chapter by giving this instruction about pure devotional service pure devotional service involves four things always thinking of krishna now always thinking of krishna was explained in the previous chapter as always chanting hare krishna that is what is taught by shri chaitanya mahaprabhu in this age to become devotee of krishna by constantly thinking of krishna what should we do we should constantly practice chanting hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare simply by doing this we can become devotees of krishna then we can worship krishna and we can offer our respects or obeisances to krishna in this way by engaging in pure devotional service we can become completely absorbed in krishna consciousness and eventually we can return to krishna that is the highest perfection to be achieved so i'll stop here shrimad bhagavad gita ki jay shila prabhupad ki jay